Welcome to Dracina Wines Podcast. Our wines plus your moments equals great memories. I'm your host, Lori, and this is a podcast about all things wine. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Dracina Wines Podcast. In today's episode, I reached out to a few of my wine blogging friends who also attended this year's Wine Bloggers Conference. The event was held in Santa Rosa, California, November 9th through the 12th. It was scheduled way before the now infamous fires that burned their way through wine country. We sat down in a live stream event that you can view on our YouTube channel, and we discussed what we thought were the highlights, lowlights, and most memorable wines of the conference. We also discussed how the best way to support the wine region is to visit and to buy their wine. There was a mass injustice done to the industry of Sonoma, Napa, and Calistoga by the media. Although many people lost their homes and businesses, the general view of the media was that wine country was devastated. We, having spent the long weekend there, discussed how this couldn't be farther from the truth. Before we get into the podcast, I'd like to announce that we are thrilled that we are now available on Spotify and Pocket Cast. If you enjoy listening to our podcast, please take a moment of your time to leave a five-star review on iTunes. This is the best way to spread the word about our podcast to other listeners. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. Okay, so we are live. Hey, everybody. How are you guys? Good. Good. Pretty well. Pretty, pretty well in a rainy day for you. Um, so Absolutely. first off, first off, welcome and thank you for joining. And um, I just want to say it was awesome to see all you guys at the Bloggers Conference. And that is really my favorite part of going to the conference is just seeing everybody. And it's just so much fun to either meet people for the first time that you've been tweeting with or Instagramming with and reading their blog posts, but you don't get to really know who they are, even though you think you do. Um, and then you get to see them, you know? So, um, Nick, you and I, you know, we go way back, but way, you know, back. way, way back, but Kent and Stacy, that was the first time I met you guys. So it was pretty awesome to meet you after reading all of your stuff. But um, Kent, why don't you start off and introduce yourself for the people who are watching or going to listen to the podcast? Okay. Um, I'm Kent Reynolds. I write Appetite for Wine. Um, and um, I know it's kind of me. I've been, been at it for a little over two years. And this was uh, my first time attending the Blogger's Conference. All right. Mm, Nick? So I am Wine Palm Guy. Uh, it was my first time attending the conference, and uh, I work both as a blogger, uh, microblogging and blogging, and uh, I work in the industry as well, so I've presented at the conference. All right. And Stacy. Uh, my name is Stacy. Hello. I write, uh, my blog is Briscoe Bites. Um, for those of you on Twitter, I'm at SL Briscoe, um, and I'm a freelance writer, wine writer as well, so um You've probably seen me around or have read me around. Read, read you around, <laughs> read you around. So, um, oh, and this was my first year at the Bloggers Conference as well. So. Oh, all right. So this was actually my second year. So I drove up um, to Lodi last year. And I have to honestly, I was completely shocked by the wines at Lodi because I thought, oh, Lodi. All right. But I can drive there, you know. Um, but the wines really impressed me. I was really, really impressed by them. Um, and they did a spectacular job of hosting us and all of the, you know, the tasting seminars and just learning about Lodi itself was really great. Um, so this was my second conference. Um, so really the important thing, what are we drinking? Well, I've got the Hannah 2016 Sauvignon Blanc. Um, picked that up at the wine excursion. We went there for lunch on Thursday, and um, it's, it's a really fantastic uh, Russian River Valley Sauvignon Blanc. Okay. Nick is in a car, so he's not drinking. <laughs> Sorry, Nick. Not, not currently. <laughs> Stacy, do you got a glass? Um, I 
actually got a little cocktail thing going on here with just a little bit of um it was, it's a new vodka actually and i wish i had the bottle with me to show you um and it's so, uh, some sonoma based um distilled vodka it's all grapes so i thought i'd give it a go um and i just kind of mixed it with a little bit of that's actually water and ice i don't pour that much vodka but no. sure <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I just thought I'd, I'd give that a go. I'm keeping things oh, kind of sure. light oh, after the conference, so. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I thought I'd still support Sonoma with my with my cocktail there. Like there I said, you it's some, some kind of Sonoma-based distillery that, again, I don't know. I have a cat on me right now, otherwise I'd go get the... Uh, oh, I see a tail. I see a tail. Yeah. So, <laughs> Sonoma, Sonoma's strong, just like Stacy's cocktails, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I am. Uh, I'm drinking Cab Franc. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Um, yeah, um, and it's a uh, Muriat as well. Oh. I, I'm on a Muriat as well. Yeah, I'm on a Muriat mm-hmm. as well. Kick. Um, had the the spur the last four nights. I was actually using the repour that we got at the conference. Um, great, great product. Yeah, so I was using that with uh, Muriat as well, and then I um, did Wine for Bet Street last night, so I had a ferment for that, so I had like two glasses left of that, so I kind of had that with my pasta for dinner, and I wanted a glass, so I just coravined some... I just coravin. Uh, you guys already answered my question of what conference this was for you. Um, but what would you say was, wh- what did you think you were getting yourself into? Like what, you know, when you signed up for it, what did you think you were going to get? I was hoping to be able to meet some of the people I've been reading and interacting with on social, which I did. Um, but I was also hoping to be able to get some tips on how to be a better writer, some of the legal aspects of it, and, um, you know, ideas for, you know, down the road being able to, um, if not monetize, at least, I guess, capitalize on my blog, um, you know, getting some samples, some trips, that sort of thing. Um, and you know, I think I accomplished that. That's good. Stacy, Nick? Um, yeah, kind of the same thing. Um, I guess learning from kind of expert bloggers and writers just how to, um, I don't know, put, have a better blogging presence out in the social media world. Um, and I feel like I, I did learn that, um, through some of the the lectures, but, uh, I feel like I learned even more from my fellow attendees, just networking and like over dinner conversations and even the excursions, just kind of talking about ourselves and the different styles of writing and the different wines that we're into. Um, It's always really interesting to hear what people's kind of niche is Mm -hmm. in the wine writing world. Um, Because I'm always looking to expand my horizons. I know a lot of the wines I review and the wineries I talk about are all very California or West Coast American based. So it was cool to meet people like um, Anatoly, who has such a wide world view perspective. And um, even like the guys from We Like Drinking who talk about like craft brews and ciders and things like that. So, um, yeah, I feel like I learned not just from the, the expert um, seminars and things like that, but from my fellow attendees, which was cool. So, yeah. Now, Nick, you were coming at it from a different angle because you're a whole different industry type concept. So what did you think? What, what did you think you were going to get? And then did you get it? So... Yes, from an industry standpoint, um, we went ahead and sponsored, you know, our table at the uh, Wines of the World Expo, and, you know, as the marketing guy, I was just hoping to expose people to our direct-to-consumer wines, Um, and I I say that because the brands that I work for have a very strong grocery retail chain presence, and I think sometimes 
wineries get lost in translation or that's how people perceive wineries is based on what they see on the shelf at a store. Um, and so this was such a captive audience of people who are influencers, you know, not even just to the everyday wine person, but to people who have really advanced palates. And so being able to get our wines in front of them where they might have you know, might not have that opportunity to get up to Oregon, you know, it is great. Um, and then from just a blogger perspective, uh, really just learning about other people's point of view. And, uh, you know, again, those writing tips, um, seeing what other people are writing about, just because, again, like Stacy said, you know, some people might be very West Coast centric, and there's others that are exploring regions that that others aren't. And I think that's uh, really important. So I, I come from it from the whole other aspect of it. So I think that a lot of the seminars, you know, like, can't you want to know how to monetize your blog and how to get more, you know, like, not like, I don't think you, I don't think anybody writes a blog thinking they're become, going to become millionaires doing it. Um, <laughs> you know, um, but wait, I'm not, Oh, sorry to disappoint. Oh, sorry. I live, I live in a car. <laughs> um, but like, I'm never going to monetize my blog because my blog is just a page on my winery website. So it's the conference really for me. Um, I, it really is just about meeting the people and getting my name out there and learning more blogs to read because you know i have so much time in my day but you know i just want to be able to find other blogs to read because that is the thing i have a very new world palette like i really drink california oregon washington wines you know not not even new world i'm like west coast people you know um and to read people's blogs who are into the old world or into, you know, other areas, you know, the, the Hudson Valley or the, the flex wines or things like that. It's interesting to read their perspective of what they're, you know, what they're tasting and how, how they go about writing. And I just, I just like writing, you know, I've always written, you know, as a little kid, I used to write, you know, stories and all of that stuff. Um, I think my mom still has them in the draw, like all of the, her little portfolio of all my drawing of all my stories. Um, so I just like writing and it's, it's just a way to express yourself in something that you like, but I like being able to meet other people who taste things that I never would taste. Like, holy cow, like Jim bringing that banyol, like, oh my God. Kent, Kent, did you get that? Did, Nick, did I, you get I that? I, I need to sit at his table next year. Oh my God. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's a good move. Um, yeah. But like, never would I have ever picked that up for myself. Like I would have walked right past that where, wherever it was, you know, cause right. it would have, and surprised me. You know, I liked it. It was really amazing to me so that's what i like about it is everybody coming together and just being able to share whatever they like so here's here's my big question because i've already um well tomorrow will be my second blog post about uh the bloggers conference uh the first one was a highlight thing but my big thing is the live blogging um you know the speed dating of wine speed dating. Speed dating, right? Um, I just, I have my very strong personality perspective of that. And I'm going to hold off to what I think um, in terms of, I have, because I again have the two views of it. I have a blogger plus a winery. But what was your, what was your experience? Because it was, you know, it's all your, you know, your first time going at it. What, what did you think? I actually, um, really liked it um because on a regular basis you know like we all have people on twitter or whatever kind of social media that you're a regular on um that you kind of converse with on a daily 
basis. Um, and so I have a little group of friends who always are like, oh, here's what I made for dinner, and here's the wine pairing that goes with it. And anytime they snap a picture of the wine, my question is, um, well, what are the tasting notes? And so I'm always pushing them, like, it's great to see what you're drinking, but what is it, you know? And I'm honestly curious. I'm not trying to be annoying or anything like that. I, I honestly want to know because you know, a lot of people are drinking things that I've either never heard of, don't have access to, or maybe I've seen it and I've just never you know, taken it off the shelf. Um, but the funny thing is, is that as much as I ask people those questions, I very, very seldom like on a random Tuesday night, we'll snap a picture of my wine and say like, this is what's in my glass. Mostly because a, I'm saving that for one of my reviews and I'm, I don't want to like give a review straight away. Um, but also because I'm still in that kind of shy mode where I'm like, maybe what I'm smelling and tasting isn't quite right. Or if I type it so fast, like, maybe it won't make sense just coming out of my mouth, you know? So I always take handwritten notes. Um, but what that exercise actually encouraged me to do was say, hey, you know, here, here's what I'm drinking. Here's what I'm experiencing at this moment. And that doesn't mean that I can't blog about it later and write up a more formal review saying here are my tasting notes. But it's kind of cool to broadcast like you know straight away like this is what I'm experiencing and um kind of doing what I force my followers to do on a regular basis um so that was that was kind of my my takeaway it was don't be shy um and it doesn't have to be right or wrong and there were some some wines where I, I tasted them and I really didn't have any notes but it was still kind of cool to just be like hey like here's a wine I've never had before, like who's experienced this, you know? So that, that was me. I, I love this myself. Um, I know a lot of people, I've, I've heard people complaining about it. I've, I've read other bloggers and saying that, you know, oh, you don't have time to analyze. But what I loved about it, I, first of all, this, this just the energy in the room at, during those sessions just phenomenal. I just, I love the energy, meeting the winemakers, they're hearing about their passion. But, you know, I think, um, like when you go wine tasting, you don't get, like, a whole glass to analyze and review, and you get a one or two ounce pour, and you have to make a snap determination in just a couple of sips on, on what you like or what you don't like. And I think that's kind of what that was about. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a big customer at Total Wine and More, and, and, you know, they have, in, at least in California, on the weekends, they have wine tastings, and that's basically what you get. You know, it's about a one-ounce pour. But I found some of my favorite wines have been through those tastings, and that's kind of what I, I liken the, the speed tasting to. So it was just a lot of fun. I enjoyed, like I said, the energy, the... Um, a lot of laughter, a lot of um, fun, and yeah, it is, you don't get a chance to really analyze it, but sometimes those snap decisions, those first impressions, are really what matter and what, what stick with you. Yep. First impressions matter. So I really enjoyed the live blogging in many aspects, and the fact that I was able to taste so many wines in a short period of time that I had never tasted before. Um, I also think it kind of depends on the table that you're at and the energy and if you're trying to snap a photo and there are people that are monopolizing either the entire uh, five minutes with the winemaker and the bottle. I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers to my second day table, but um, the first day table was, was really great. Um, and then from a winery perspective, even though we didn't pour during that event, um, trying to get the story out in say five minutes or hoping that your wine is open. Um, you know, I know that some of them were just popping bottles and if you're expecting a wine to open in five minutes, especially some of those reds, uh, I actually found that, you know, if there was a delay in winemaker coming around, 
I had a better chance to smell and taste all of those aromatics and all those flavors a little later than in that initial impression. And I think that could be dangerous for some of those winemakers. Anatoly, why don't you do a quick intro of who you are and uh, where people can find you and then tell us your thoughts. Okay. So I'm um, Anatoly Levine. Um, uh, I have a blog called Tokavino. Uh, and uh, so that's where you can find me. Talk, uh, tokavino.com. It's, I, you, you can go by either spelling. Talk, tokavino is one line or talk dash a dash vino dot com um so it's uh labor of passion uh, i've been uh, doing this uh, i have a blog for uh, uh about seven plus years uh and uh i drink a lot of wine that's <laughs> all i can tell you you know <laughs> and so <laughs> um so yeah no you you and uh, so you guys talking about live blogging, I like it. I um, so this is my third conference, so I, I essentially knew what to expect. You 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 absolutely correct uh, about uh, being at the right table. So our table number five. Next time, try to be at the table number five <laughs> because that's the best table. Uh, and uh, we all shared. We nobody monopolized uh, the bottles. We we all shared, and we we, we know how it works. It's. Uh, uh, you, you have to insert uh, yourself a little bit into the process, ask a presenter for a second bottle to take shots and everything. So you can manage that. Uh, as far as um, the wine, the, the wine, the, the, the way the wine tastes, you know, it's that that's tough. You, you're absolutely right. It's uh, especially for the reds or whatever, the, some of the bigger whites. Uh, yeah, you, you want them to be open. And uh, this is. So the, the winemaker who is getting into this really should know what's the best way to present their wines because it's, nobody's asking to open the wine at the table, right? But you really, as very often in, uh, in, in real life, you only get one chance. So if you, if the wine was not show, it's, um, you, you, I mean, you know, if you're in a restaurant and you know what you're ordering, yeah, you can uh, tell people, okay, let's wait 30 minutes. I, I guarantee you, you will love it, and that's it. But here, this is different purpose, so you really have to. You you want to. This is. I, I think it's a. It's an interesting marketing opportunity for winemakers. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any stats for uh, trending like during this type of like live session. If uh, let's say WBC 17 was trending. And uh, as a hashtag, or and, and how high was trending, but, but I would think we, we were creating some, bomb. not the highest, but but I'm sure. So it, it's um, uh, I, I think it's interesting. It, it's uh, it's an interesting opportunity for me. I, I love it. I mean, this is it, it's it's a cool challenge, and uh, this is a really interesting exercise. So, in terms of for me, in terms of being a blogger, I enjoyed this year much better than last year. So last year I was. I was stressed. Like, um, the first day, the first day I was beyond stressed. I was like, ah, you know, whatever. And then the second day I, <laughs> I relaxed a bit. Um, but I still was stressed this year. Having had last year's experience, I was much more relaxed and I was prepared to listen. And I kind of knew that I wasn't doing tasting notes into the tweets. I was trying to get um, information out about the winery in my tweets. So, you know, I wasn't really paying attention to that aspect of it. I just wanted to tweet out, this is the winery, you know, this might be how many cases they produce of this wine. Um, you know, uh, what, what their, you know, if they have a state, you know, a, a motto or something like that. So it was much more relaxed for me this year. Um, in terms of the other side of it as being a winery, um, that's where I question this. And I'm not saying it's, it, again, going back to stats, I would love to see the stats on this. Um, do, because as a winery, everything I do is for an ROI. You know, what's my return on investment? So I'm pouring and I think it costs $500 to pour. Um, plus you're supplying your wine. 
So for little old me, that's a lot of money, you know? Um, but people are so involved in looking at their phones or their iPads or whatever and tweeting. I'm not sure they remember a, you know, they remember the wines. Now you are taking pictures so you can go back and you can look at your own tweets. So I would like to see what the stats are to did, do these wineries get sales off of this? You know, you're, you are getting 50 minutes of a blast of your winery name. So it's going out there, but I, I'm curious as to what that ROI is. Um, because for me, $500 needs to be a lot of sales. Lori, this is a tough one because I don't think you can directly, I, I don't know if you sell wine on Twitter. I really yeah. don't think so. You build brand. This is, uh, it, it's the same. It's like, you could never tell if TV advertisement, uh, how many bottles were sold based on a TV advertisement. It's, right. It's a brand. This is, you, you create buzz. So. When you present your wine, so theoretically, you should get, uh, what, eight bloggers, ten bloggers at the table, ten tables uh, you can run through. Right. So you should get uh, between 80 and 100 impressions, uh, which you can then, and I would guarantee you that at least, I, I would be surprised if at least not 20, at least 25% of those are not favorable, saying, wow, this is a great wine, etc. So now you can take those tweets, and you can then, now you can spin them. Right. right. So you can you can really do your branding. And uh, I don't know. I, I, I think it's not bad. I, it's hard to tell. Well, my my thought is my my afterthought is that there's wineries that come back year after year. So there's mm -hmm. got there has to be some sort of ROI. There's got to be some sort of return on investment there, um, you know, and, and the bigger the winery you know, not that anybody thinks five hundred dollars. Um, oh, Lori. Yes. Uh, have you ever talked to Craig? Craig Camp. Yeah. Yeah. Not about this. Not not about that. But I have talked about him. But he has done it a couple of times. So no, that's no, what no, I'm. No, no, that's that, that's. I'm just. Yeah, yeah. I'm just answering what you said. You wonder if it makes sense. So Craig is here every year. Right. That's what I'm saying. At least so three years, which I was there, he was there with his wine. So. He, I mean, he, he doesn't, it, this is hard work for him. He brings wines. He have to talk to people all the time and everything. This is, I'm sure he enjoys it, but, but it, it would be zero ROI. Right. I don't think he would do it. Right. And that, that's what I'm saying. What that, that was my, my after statement was there are wineries that come back over and over again. So they must see something because, you know, if they don't, they're not going to be coming back. Um, yeah. But so going back to the live blogging, uh, did anybody have a wow wine that like one wine that totally stood out, either white, red, rosé? Did did anybody have one that they were like, wow, this is this is a memorable? I was actually, I was actually blown away by the Letty Old Vine Chardonnay. I'd um, never even experienced an Old Vine Chardonnay before, and it was it just it blew my mind. So that's the one that stood out to me. Okay. I think, um, well, the, the wine that's, that keeps sticking out in my head, I think it was uh, the Graciana, there was a Graciana right. Pinot Noir, I think yeah. it was. And see, I'd have to look at my notes to double check what it was. But um, that That's the one. But yeah, but to me, the that's gift that, one, right? That, that was yeah, the gift one. Yeah. Um, and I think to kind of loop that into your, your previous question, I think, for the, the wineries to really see some kind of ROI, it's going to be about the connection that they made with the bloggers at that moment. So for me, if I, I mean, I took all the business cards and things mm -hmm. that people gave me, but um, like I have like a little goodie bag here where I organized everything and the ones that really stuck out in my head, like I'm interested about either a specific wine or learning more about their story and I want to include them somehow in either my professional or personal writing career. Um, those are the people that I followed up with immediately saying, Hey, it was great to meet you. Um, I'm interested in your wines. Like how can we work together? Um, so kind of, I think it was Anatoly was saying, it's like you have those five, 10 minutes or whatever to make a personal pitch or connection with the bloggers. Um, so you might not see an immediate 
you know, like sales or anything right. like that, but you'll see you, you depending on the blogger, because we all have different reaches and things like that, but you might eventually see um, some kind of turnaround or some kind of benefit to making that connection because, you know, we all have different groups that we associate with and different chat groups that we do and different kinds of social media presences. And I, I think that all kind of helps. And I think that's why we try to be as friendly and as personable as, as possible because we're just, we're all working together in the same little niche right. here. Right. Um, for, for me, the, and I was, um, I was the oddball, I guess, at our table. And not that I didn't like that um, Graciano uh, Pino. I thought that was, I, I thought it was a stellar, stellar wine. But the the orgasmic. Um, uh, oh. Sam... No, 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 no. Um, oh, no. Okay. No, it was oh. orgasmic. It, the winery is orgasmic. Oh, okay. um, And it was uh, San, Gio, San Giovese. Um and that that blew my mind. Um, I I loved that wine. And then the Jeffs of We Like Drinking podcast. Um, and Stacey, you guys really loved that Pinot. And I loved, I thought that Pinot was fantastic also. But they were at the same price uh, point. And for me, I would I would go with, you know, for that price point, um, I think the, the Pinot was $72. Um, so for me, 72 is high for a Pinot, um, where the orgasmic was 70 for the Sangiovese. So it's not, it's the same price, but for that, for me, I would have gone with that, you know, with that. Um, but those two wines were definitely standouts to me. Those were... Those were ones that I remember that I remember the name. I remember the wine. I remember what it tasted like on, you know, on my palate and I will go hunt them down, you know? Um, but <laughs> so watch out. I'm coming. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so. I don't know. Un unfortunately th th this year I can still give you my favorites from the Lodi, <laughs> but not from this year. Oh. This year was I, I was not happy with, uh, you know, and, and so <laughs> the big problem is, you know, I, I, unfortunately, it, it's ingrained in me. So I always look at the QPR. Mm -hmm. So the San Giovese for $70. It's a lot of money. Sweet as it is. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I mean... I'll drink Brunello for 40, for 30, but this, the, I mean, this is just, this is non-starter in my game, you know? And uh, the Pinot for 72, if it would be mind-blowing Pinot, okay, I would give it, but, uh, I mean, I, I would understand, but uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I would, for instance, I don't know if you guys had uh, Antica Terra wines, uh, Antica Terra is uh, it's a small winery um, in uh, Oregon uh, where I forgot the uh, winemaker's name, but she was uh, trained under uh, Crankle at uh, Synquanon. So she makes like amazing wines. Those are at least ninety dollars. Rosé, Chardonnay, Pinot. I mean, she has only one price point, ninety dollars, I think. But you just can't compare the right. amount of pleasure you you get. So I, I don't, don't 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 get me wrong. I don't look at the price per se, right? I'm I'm not saying I, uh, I mean it. Uh, the, the wine have to be twenty dollars, or I'm just like there there is nothing beyond that. Absolutely not. But but I always look for what you get for your money, and unfortunately for me, that just uh, both of those were, were not working. Uh, and and this was more or less the, the the issue was a lot of you know it was an issue for me with a lot of wines. I, I, I keep uh, Stacy, I'm not going <laughs> keep bringing back Lodi on purpose, honestly. But uh, truly, I mean, uncomparable with what was in Lodi. I just can't compare. You you get for twenty five, thirty dollars, you get wines which literally knocks your socks off. I mean, I, I still remember. The, um, Lori, did you have Lucas Chardonnay? Oh my God! Yes. Remember? Yes. Two thousand one California Chardonnay, Lucas. It 
it's not cheap. It's 48 bucks. It's not a cheap wine. But 2001, and we were drinking it two years ago. This was insane. This was absolutely insane, the, the way this wine was. And that, that truly stuck in my memory, you know. Wake me up, I'll tell you about it, you know. So this is, um, that's, uh, so so this year, unfortunately, in a speed tasting, I don't think I experienced anything like that. But that, I think, is um, Sonoma, you know. Um, yeah. And I I love Sonoma. I really do. Um, I, I like it better than Napa. Well, sorry. Um, but um, I, I like the personality of Sonoma. I'm not even going wines because um, there's Napa wines that I adore. There's Sonoma wines that I don't like, you know, so it's, you know, um, I just like the personality of Sonoma better. Um, but you're not getting, Lodi is up and coming. So they can't afford to charge the prices that Sonoma and Napa charge. Um, nobody's going to buy it. It's, you know, it's the same thing. You know, um, my Cab Franc is $32. I talk to people, you know, who own wineries in Napa and Sonoma, and they're telling me I need to charge more money for my Cab Franc. But it's it's Paso. I, I'm, I'm not... I'm not Sonoma. I'm not Napa. And that's not saying that I don't think my Cab Franc is, is fantastic because I do, you know, but you have to charge what's, what your region is. Um, and the other thing, and I don't mean this meanly, but I think this is what you're getting at until is, is like Lodi had, um, they were like an underdog, you know, it's like, if you go to sports wise, you know, like everybody went to Lodi, like, all right, it's Lodi. And I think Lodi had a grudge and they were like, yeah, we are Lodi and we are going to prove that we can kick ass, you know? Um, and they did. And they did, and they did. where Sonoma is Sonoma. What are, what are they going to prove? They're already, you know, they're already Sonoma. This was my problem. This I mentioned that many times that my, my, my one of my biggest challenge with, with the conference is that we really had no local host. Unlike Lodi, when we, we knew who is, ho who is hosting mm -hmm. us here. Okay. Hello bloggers. Let's start our conference. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's the region it's, you know, it's the region. And I, I'm, I'm kind of curious as to what Walla Walla is going to do. Walla Walla will be, I, I think, I think Walla Walla will be great because Walla Walla is an underdog. Washington is, you know, Sonoma takes prime real estate in any wine store. Right. Next to, right next to Napa. Yeah. Walla Walla, mm, no, they more in the back of the store. Right. I mean, the Washington wines, yes, you have to ask for them. Yeah. So I, I think, I, I think it's going to be think, interesting. I don't know. But I do think Sonoma, I love how you are petting that tail, Stacey. <laughs> um, uh, for people on the podcast, that's really going to sound weird because they're not saying. <laughs> no, no, we, but we, we understand. Yeah. Yes. Um, but no, yeah, so I, I think. He's, he's around. So where? Um, I, I love Sonoma. I really do love Napa. We go there on a somewhat regular basis. But we used to go there all the time until we found Paso. And we fell in love with Paso. And, um, you know, it's it's a different location they treat it differently and everything is different i think um i agree lodi you knew who was sponsoring this you know the conference sonoma was kind of like yeah we're sonoma but the wines i thought were really you know i enjoyed the wines i'm not going to say i didn't um but that's that's just my hearsay whatever yeah uh, listen i'm i'm all with you <laughs> but so, Not so, and so that, that's obviously then your disappointed moment. Stacy, can, did you guys have a disappointing moment? Um, I think for me, um, to try to go off of what Anatoly was saying was, um, especially when it came to the, um, conference provided, lunch and dinner that we had, I felt a significant lack 
of local pride when it came to produce in Sonoma. One of the things I really enjoy about um, Sonoma in general, whether you go to a, a fancy restaurant or just like a local diner, is their pride in their local produce. Um, and I did I did an excursion to Jordan Winery, and they're all about um, you know sourcing from their estate. Um, edible garden and then within like a certain radius around the winery um, and so I feel that was something that was missing um, when we had our, our lunch um, I think it was the Friday lunch um, that was the, the wines were prepared from El Dorado which right. was cool I like El Dorado wines and, and um, Sierra Foothill wines have a, an amazing um, footprint that they put on their wines but the the pairing didn't really make sense with our just kind of like hotel buffet situation. There was no pairing. Um, yeah, that's what, that's what I mean. Um, and then same thing with the dinner. Um, you know, we had naked wines that provides wines from kind of all over the world, really. Um, but it didn't make sense with the food that we were having. So I felt a, a significant um, lack of um, local produce and local food and when we're talking about wine and we're talking about um, wherever it is the conference is, whether it's Lodi or Walla Walla or Sonoma, you you want to experience the wines in context, in context with the food. I think that's an important aspect of wine tasting, and that's that was a, a major disconnect for me. Um, and I know a lot of people kind of were disappointed with that. So, uh, Stacy, uh, that would be challenging. I can tell you, at least I, I attended three of the conferences. So, <coughs> to to like really what you are saying, to to be able to pair and everything. Uh, look, someone's paying for this, right? So this is for us. It's kind of it's included into the program. Whatever we pay, ninety five dollars or whatever we pay, right? So um, that's not tremendous amount of money to be able to truly like someone. If you're gonna work on a pairing, it, it's uh, I mean it will involve right. So you didn't pay off local again. I, the local host was non-existent. So th there should be money and it should be a desire to present it like that. And I can tell you in Lodai, um, the food, I, I even don't remember the food. We had right? the picnic. I, I, I have, we had the picnic, food. remember? So the food was okay. But, you know, no, the, the food was okay. But the thing in Lodai was at every table, there was a winemaker. At every table, they were sitting in a winemaker, assistant winemaker. They were pouring their wines. They were talking to the people. So there was a totally different atmosphere. We were together. We were embraced, and we, we felt that we – I mean, and at, at that point, you know, when uh, Mike McKay was walking around with his uh, uh, holding, uh, I think it is a magnum or three liter of his uh, uh, green ash just pouring around for the people, you know, uh, who cares about food? I mean, you you really you embraced you 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 enjoy you you enjoy that uh, that the atmosphere, the camaraderie, whatever. You 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 really enjoy that uh, the, the whole thing, and and those are good wines, you know. And uh, so uh, you you can definitely do it better. I mean, it's just um, th this one was yeah. I, I don't want to even talk about lunch. That was not even funny. So Amber, yay! You yeah. made hey. it. Sorry, guys. Oh, that's, that's okay. Fine. I'm glad you made it. Um, so why don't you do a very quick, uh, you know, brief introduction of yourself and let people know where they can find you. But what my question was, we were talking about the highlights and things like that. And that question was, did you have a disappointing moment at the conference? So You know, my name is, first of all, I'm Amber, and I write for Napa Food and Vine, and you can find us at www.napafoodandvine.com. Um, my, I think with the conference, the only thing that was really disappointing to me was that there were so many things. I, I mean, I was quite lucky because my husband was at the conference with me, um, but there were so many classes that I would have liked to have taken and they they did them side by side so you had to choose so if you're a single person right. then I mean like Stacy or you that were there by yourself 
there was, I'm sure that there was plenty of classes that you would have liked to have gone to that you couldn't go to. And th that was really frustrating to me because, you know, there was, there was just plain things that I would have liked to have done that I didn't get the opportunity to do. Um, you know, that, that's pretty much it with the conference that I was disappointed in. Um, I also thought that, you know, yeah, having Naked Wines as the sponsor, nakedwines.com, let's make dot that com. one clear, uh, dot com as the sponsor, you know, with the, with the quality of wines that we were drinking all through the entire conference, everybody's giving us wine and whatever, it was really disappointing to have wines of that caliber, um, I, I thought, I know that, that, you know, not everyone thinks so, but I, I, I really was disappointed that they were sponsoring it because I just didn't think that they, the I wines were that. good enough. When you're talking wine bloggers, these are all wine connoisseurs. And when you're talking about very inexpensive, as far as I'm, I could tell, uh, like supermarket wines, I mean, it would, I, that was really disappointing to me, um, in, in the conference. Other than that, I really loved all of the things that they did. I thought some of the classes were super great as far as like the legal aspects. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that was pretty much my, my main complaint is the, the two things of, you know, having too many things that were interesting stacked together and then, you know, not having the quality wine as the, whoever is going to sponsor. But, but I guess it is it is what it is, right? Right. I mean, it, it's big bucks to sponsor, so they're going to take who they can get. Um, but I think that plays back to what everybody was saying previously is, you know, like Stacey, the, the sense of home of being Sonoma, um, whatever your thoughts are of Naked Wine, dot com um that whether you think it's a good wine a bad wine quality not quality whatever they're not really sonoma they're right. they're like you said amber all over the place where you know stacy you're saying it should be a sense of home sonoma should be proud sonoma should be um representing themselves so i i think that that ties it in more so than you know, I, I'm always leery to say that's good quality wine, bad quality wine. It's just, I, I just am not comfortable saying that. Um, you know, there's there's 399 wine that people that I know, like, that's their jam. They love it. And that's why it's there. Um, but they weren't Sonoma. They were, we're going to get grapes from wherever we can get grapes from. Um, and I, I think that it should have been Sonoma, but then as a business aspect, like Anatola was saying, you know, 95 or $99 to attend this conference, um, is not a lot of money to get things going. So whoever is going to pay to sponsor, that's, that's where the money's coming in from. And but but wait on that, though. I mean, yes, we all paid the $99, but many of the other people, the PR agents and whatever, who don't write, they had to pay a whole lot more right. than we did. Right. And every single thing that these sponsors all through the conference did, I mean, this was a serious moneymaker. Oh, you yeah. Know, they all paid to be there. Right. And they paid a lot of money to mm -hmm. be there. Yeah, because I got I got the email I got the email to sponsor, and right. it was it was uh, one thing was thirty five hundred dollars and one thing was forty five hundred dollars. Um, so right. that that's that's a lot of money, you know. Right. It um, is. Just to, just to bring it back around to the nakedwine dot com thing, so I've been a member of nakedwine dot com for about three years, and you know they they do have some really stellar wine. Um, whether or not they serve them at the event, yeah, that's up for debate. But I think to, to kind of tie it into Sonoma, while their U.S. headquarters is in Napa, their winery facility itself is in Kenwood. I think that's probably where the tie-in was. They were thinking of themselves as a, as a Kenwood, Sonoma County winery because that's where the production facility is located. So 
So if that helps. I, I figured that they were located somewhere in Sonoma. Um, but like when he came around, um, he, I think the, I don't, he poured something. I think it was from, uh, Chile. Right. So that, that's, that's where I'm going, you know, that, right. No, I, I would agree that they, they could have done a better job representing Sonoma County. Um, cause they had a Chilean wine. They had something from France. They had, um, you know, uh, the, the Chenin Blanc. Um, I'm a, I'm a big fan of that Chenin Blanc, but it's from Clarksburg, you know? So, I mean, right. You know, so yeah, they could have done a better job representing Sonoma County. Um, but it, it, you know, I, I think that's, again, just bringing it back to the Sonoma County connection. That's where their wine facility is. So even the, the Chamois that's sourced from Clarksburg, it's actually minted and bottled in Sonoma. Right. And as we all know, you know, wineries are located in one place and many wineries get fruit from outside of that. You know, so it is, it is you know, a yeah. very normal thing to happen. Um, well, and I, I actually connected with um, NakedWines.com after the, um, after the conference, and I specifically asked them to send me um, a variety of wines that represent small boutique local wineries that don't have a brick and mortar tasting room, but the, the purpose for using their Kenwood estate crush pad um, was because they don't have the means to have the space for their own. So they, and they sent me like uh, somewhere between six and 12 wines. So they have a good chunk of people that they could have represented at that dinner. Um, and so I think, you know, if I had any feedback for them as, as sponsors, I would have, I would say, you know, steer in that direction. If you're, if you're, if you're going to be presenting your wines, and you're an eclectic kind of winery like that, you're going to be representing your company, you know, pay homage to the place that you are at and represent those that are up and coming people that might need a little bit more attention. Um, and, uh, and I, I don't know what table you were at, um, but at our table, it seemed like, and I, and I don't mean this disrespectfully because it was a large event. There's many, many people. Um, we didn't have anybody pour us any wine. We had bottles just kind of um, plopped at our table uh, without any explanation as to what it was that wow. we were drinking. Um, so we, it was up to us to pick up the bottle and be like, what you is know, this? At the dinner, right? At the dinner. Say, at the dinner. Oh, yeah. yeah. There, there were no explanations. Yeah. We, no we had to run for our own wines. Right. right. Whatever you can get. We, um, so we were just kind of like, you know, grabbing bottles and like, what is this? And we had a magnum of, of something, and I don't remember what it was, that wasn't even open for us. So we had to go and find someone to give us a, a corkscrew even. So there was no sommelier at the table or even, a, you know, a knowledgeable representative saying, hey, this is what we provided you and here's why. And right. let me pour you a taste and, you know, tell you the story of this wine. Um, so kind of regardless of the region, we had no background information about what was being served to us. And it was just a why. bottle. It was just it a was bottle. Just like, we had here's exactly. some wine. Right. That, like, that's how it was. Uh, nobody yeah. was pouring wine. So, so slightly St different. Stacy, I have a question because I did not get this from them, which would have been something if if I understood you correctly. NakedWines.com is an actual AP. There's there's other labels being produced at their brick and mortar facility. Mm -hmm. See, I had no clue about that. Did did anybody else know that? That it's 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 kind of what? it's kind of weird, like a, a long, almost kind of convoluted story. I'm just I know Connell is the guy who is in charge of um of that, or it's kind of his little little baby, um and. The whole thing is is the wine production is run through angels. So um, if you're not familiar with the angel program, it's sort of like um, uh, you know entre not entrepreneurs, but um, people kind of, yeah, like a crowdsourcing kind of a thing. But people donate money and help these small boutique wineries get up and running. Um, and it's it's basically the backside, oh, Stacy. 
I'm talking about but, the tech side, actually how wineries deal with them or how they deal with wineries. So oh, their yeah. financing come from the, yeah, it's a crowdsourcing. I agree on that. That That's what they were trying to sell at the conference. So yeah, come, come yeah. and become yeah. Los Angeles. Right. I, I, I had emails from them Thank about you. that. But Carl was explaining to me that the backside, how it works for the wineries and uh, there were some saying, so he was, I, I don't know, I don't want to say it because he was, I, I did not grasp it. So Kent, I'm sorry, when you get, when you belong to their club, are you get, are all labels that you're getting nakedwines.com or are you getting other wineries? So they're, they're not other wineries at all. So their, their basic premise is they hire winemakers. And so the wines are marketed under the winemaker's own name. So um, I know at the, um, at the uh, conference, there was the Miriam Alexander Chenin Blanc, okay? Um, Alexander Farber is the winemaker. She chose that name. Um, and I'm actually going to be posting a, a, a blog in the near future. Um, I did an interview with her and kind of explained how she came up with that name. Um, there was the, the Magnum, I believe, was the Matt Parrish um, Napa Cabernet, Matt Parrish being the winemaker. So they, they go out and they find the winemakers, and their, their premise is that they give the winemakers the opportunity to craft wines the way they want to, um, as opposed to a lot of these winemakers have day jobs in the big wine houses where they're forced to produce wines the way the wine house wants it. Mm -hmm. um, so it gives them the opportunity to be individual and creative and create their own wines the way they want to. And so all the, all the wines are labeled by the individual winemakers as opposed to a wine so I don't know if this is um, I don't know if this is beyond too technical of a question for you uh, who has the O2 do we do you know what an O2 so so for example um, we don't have a brick and mortar building Dracina wines cannot afford a brick and mortar building right, right. so we are there is a facility at, at our winery it's our winery but it's a facility and in that facility it is owned by first and last winery and at first and last winery there are I believe and I'm not 100% sure I believe there's 20 wineries including us somewhere in that vicinity in there we all basically it's called an alternate proprietorship so we we use their equipment. So first and last winery is going to pay for all of that equipment. I can't afford that. But I pay first and last winery in terms of how many cases I produce and what I want to do. But it's my winery. I have my own O2. So right. if you walk into first and last winery on their wall, there are all of the O2 licenses of all of the people who have wines, who produce their wines there. So, Dracina, you never see First and Last Winery anywhere. You're seeing Dracina Wines. You're seeing, you know, the other wineries that are there. So, they're, they're, every winery has their own O2. Sure. Is that, is, is that what this is? I don't think so. This is something like the, that. I think this is something like that. Yeah, on, on the back label... On the back label of every bottle, it's going to identify it as a nakedwines.com. Yeah, wine. but but it, but it's uh, no, uh, but at the same time, it's identified as a naked wine. So right. It's, yeah. it's like that, but it's not 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 exactly. Yeah. So I just I pulled out a couple of bottles um, from the package that I got today. Um. So in the front of the bottle, like this one has the name of of the winemaker Jacqueline Bahu. Sorry, I don't know how to say that last name. Um. And then on the back, it has a little letter saying, Dear Angels, thank you for your, for your support. And at the very bottom, um, it has nakedwines.com. Um, Stacy, what does it say? Here. What does it say in terms of bottled and produced by? On right. the back, so, what does um, it say? On the back, it just says, um, so all of them will have like a little thank you to the angels. Mm -hmm. And then get the inside story, download our free app, nakedwides.com slash app. So that's how they're they're putting their footprint on the actual bottle. Right, but it's got to say somewhere on there, 
by legal yeah. wise. Vincent, Vincent there, and Bottle by Naked Wine Song. There Bottle. you go. Okay, that's the answer right there. That's the right. answer right yeah. there. They do have international producers that do source from all over the world, and in those cases, um, I, I don't know the specific stat, but sometimes they import the finished product in bottle. Other times they they import the juice and then finish it at the winery in Kenwood. It just depends on the various laws, international laws, and whatnot. Right. But they're all going to, to identify themselves as a wine produced and distributed by NakedWines.com. Right. So by them putting vinted and bottled by, that means that they those winemakers do not have an O2 there. Okay. Those, those winemakers are working under the blanket of naked wines. So the and I'm going to forget what the heck that number is because there's another you know it's an O2 and a blah blah another number, um, but it's uh, four uh, four seventy. But I don't 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 take that to the bank. Um, that means that I can make wine, but I'm under your umbrella. So right. that's what that is. So those people yeah, do. They're under, they're under yeah. Right. And, and I believe they also source grapes for you. So I don't know what's white maker role. You you probably can decide. That's like I can go to City Winery in New York and uh, they'll they'll tell me, okay, here's the Chilean. You can like choose choose your grapes and decide what you want to do with them. But really, that's not a lot of wine making there. But anyway. Right. Well, that that might not that might not necessarily be true. Because I mean I don't know how it is with naked naked wine, but but legality wise, uh, you could be sort you could you could be responsible for telling the the whoever is sourcing your whoever you are sourcing the fruit from, you could say I want it picked at this you know bricks level. I want you to drop the fruit. I want you to do this. But here's the deal. I can't afford to deal with all of that legality stuff and monetary wise. It costs more money to have an O2 license and then I'm required, I'm responsible to do all of the um, government mandated documents. Whereas if you have the other license, which is what these people are doing, the winemaker, he can make all or she can make all the decisions they want but they're not responsible for any compliance whatsoever. Nakedwines.com is doing all of that compliance. So it's it's a different it's it's how you how you want to be represented. So it doesn't mean that one wine is better than the other wine. It's how you want to approach the legality of it, how you approach the TTB. So that's that's the difference between the O2 and whatever the other number is that I don't remember what it is. Um, but so getting off of nakedwines.com, we talked about what a disappointment it is. Let's talk about the positive side of the conference and what was the best thing that you thought of the conference? Anyone? For me, for me, it was the inclusion, the acceptance, the warmth and, and being embraced by the blogger community, um, especially this was my first conference. I've only been at it for a couple of years. Frankly, I don't have a huge, um, you know, exposure, but that didn't seem to matter to anybody. Um, I was there, I was a blogger, and that's all that mattered. And I just felt really warm and welcome, and I feel like part of the family. Yeah, I have to agree. It was my first conference as well. Um, I've been, my blog's less than two years old um, and I was just surprised by the first night when I walked into the room how many people already knew and liked me <laughs> and I'm like oh it's, you know it's nice to know that people like me in real life and not just you know um, saying nice things via tweets and comments and things like that um, but also um, making that kind of personal connection I know Amber and I have met at least one other time in the past. So um, I had at least one friendly face that was there, but to see others who I either know them by photo or I'd have to look at their name tag and just see their Twitter handle and say, oh, hey, I, you know, I, I do know you. Um, and just to already have something in common, you know, wine, 
um, and to learn more about them on a both professional and personal level. Um, and I really appreciate how I was able to talk openly about wine um, with everyone because for me, you know, writing about wine is completely different than talking about it. It's sort of, for me, it's sort of like learning a new language. I, I can, you know, read my Italian notes and I can, I can take my Italian notes, but speaking in front of someone in Italian is like, uh -uh, no. And you know, you have that liberty when you're, when you're writing on your blog to like take a time out and maybe look up a few facts that you're not sure about, you know, contact the winemaker and say like, Hey, you know, I tasted this. Is, is that because you made it this way or the other? When you're in front of people and, and, and you're, you're talking about wine, you don't have that luxury. It's, hey, let me pour you this 1962 wine that's been in cask until 2014, and I'm just now opening it, you know, a few years later. What I'm do you so think? I'm about that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you know what I'm saying? And even after the conference, you know, you go to these little social gatherings and everybody would bring a wine to share because they like, hey, like I had this in the cellar and I want to share it with you guys. What do you think? And you you feel a little bit on the spot, but at the same time, I felt so, this is the most comfortable I've felt just being able to go at it and say, this is what I smell and this is what I taste and not even whether I like it or I don't like it, but this, this is me talking about wine like a person would talk about last night's soccer game or something, you know? So I really appreciated that. Amber? Uh, well, I have to agree. I mean, it was so awesome. There was, it, it, I started laughing at one point because there was kind of this game that everybody was like, where's Amber? <laughs> and I heard yes. that from like, I can't even tell you how many people are like, we're all going, where's Amber? Where's Amber? And Stacy was like, she's, I just saw her. She's over there. And it was like, kind of where, where's Waldo, but it's where's Amber. <laughs> so, I mean, so many people that I've met on Twitter and, and have just been so gracious to me and, were there and, and I could actually give them hugs and that was so nice um, just meeting everyone was just amazing and some of these people there was not one person that I thought oh they're really stuck up in fact the most successful bloggers were the nicest I thought you know and they were you know willing to spend you know however long talking to you and just you know, enjoying you and, and sharing with you. And I loved that. That was wonderful. And, 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 you know, it was really nice because a lot of people, I guess, you know, read what I'm writing and they really respect what I'm saying out there. Um, and so that was really nice that people were looking to me and respecting, you know, what, what we're doing. So that, that was really nice to feel that acceptance, you know, just like Kevin said, you know, that, that warmth and that acceptance from everyone. And then also, I guess the other thing was that, that came out of this is that, you know, I, people that I've met at, you know, at the conference, you know, Hey, I know this. And other people have said, Hey, I know this. Can I can help you and passing it along. And I loved that. I'm always all about passing it along, whatever it is, whether it be knowledge or wine or whatever it is. I love that there was such a sense of community. I agree. I agree. Anatoly. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, yeah, you guys already said it. I mean, it's, uh, people is the best part of this, uh, event because you, you get to like, yeah, you, I, I never, Stacy, I knew your handle, but that's about it. But, uh, <laughs> It kind took, of same with you, honestly. <laughs> it took five seconds, whatever. Right. <laughs> so that that's I, I love that because that that's that's the best part. You you like you you meet people and you know it's uh, we we all like we 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 there because we have common interest and uh, common passion. This is uh, the wine is is the thing, right? So that's that's why we're there. So this this is the best part. But overall, there were a lot of highlights. I mean. Um, yeah, we talked about that stuff, but but uh, but in general, uh, Beringer class was outstanding, and uh, um, 
uh, uh, um, Doc Frost was amazing. I love yeah. Doc Frost. He his sense of humor is he just. Is really I mean, the guy is just unbelievable. I mean, he's a great. He's very approachable also. I mean, he, he's a great guy. I mean, that that session was outstanding. The I, I was in the Alsace tasting. The wines were amazing. Absolutely. Um, uh, uh, Jordan. Uh, I mean, forget about it. That was just <laughs> out of this world experience. This is. Uh, so special and, and everything so you know i mean the, there were tons of highlights tons and okay. uh, it, it even like driving there and uh like looking at all these beautiful vineyards and then driving when we went for um uh, i i did the post uh, excursion uh, with napa vintners that was i mean really heartbreaking too we we, we were driving by all the fires that was insanity i mean it was necessary to see but it's it, it just kills you what you see it's it's very hard to convey that but uh i mean it's all so the, the, the tons of experiences that, that definitely definitely this uh wine tasting we had at uh, castello de moroso that was <laughs> very impressive uh the wines unfortunately for me were not but uh, the the whole setting was insane i mean this is uh, i i could not believe that uh uh, th this castle was completed 10 years ago. It looks like it, uh, as, as it was there for a thousand years. I mean, everything, they have everything. The, the downstairs, the, the torture chamber, the whatever. I mean, incredible. Just absolutely incredible. Uh, so, yeah, it was, for me, there were tons of highlights. Tons. Well, I think um, for me, it really is all about just meeting the people. Um, you know, I... I like being social, in case you couldn't have guessed that. Um, wow, yeah. really? <laughs> um, you know, just like meeting people, you know, like Amber, we've talked on the phone, you know, oh, know. last year, you know, we talk all the time on social media. And totally, I've, I've met you before, but I remember the first time I met you, you know, and then each time, you know, when we meet in the city and things like that, you know, Kent, you know, just we talk we talk through Twitter or through social media or whatever, but to actually finally put the real face, because we, we all knew what each other looked like, you know, but to be able to put the real face to the real person is, you know, is phenomenal. And I think the concept that we talk to each other so much online that we feel like we've been lifetime friends, you know, Stacy, we, we joked earlier, you know, Ryan and I, picked Stacy up from her hotel and we had never met before and we literally just pulled in and Ryan yelled out, Hey lady, you know, and she gets this big smile on her face and she comes running and gets in the truck, you know, it's like, you know, um, and it was instant. I think we were inseparable the, you know, for pretty much the entire conference along with the jets, you know, it was the same thing. You know, I was with you when we walked into the opening reception and uh, I don't know which of the Jeffs yelled Stacy, but, you know, it was like you went running to them that, you know, it was like it was it's instantaneous friends because we've known each other online for so long. And that to me is is by far the highlight of any of the conferences, any of the things is getting to see the people in real life. And even if it is just the once a year, you know. Um, yeah, Anatoly, I get to see you more than just once a year because we're, you know, we're close, um, in proximity, but, you know, um, and when I'm in my, you know, other side of the coast, you know, we're not that far, so we can make it, you know, um, we can see each other, but that by far to me is the best aspect of it. But, um, so my, my last thing is, is because we can't just, um, talk about this conference without, um, highlighting or, you know, talking about, uh, and until you brought it up a little bit, um, I think that one of my biggest pet peeves, it's not even a pet peeve, I'm beyond a pet peeve with this, um, is being on the East Coast with when the fires occurred. According to the East Coast news, it was the end of the world out there. And even the LA Times was writing that it was massive destruction. And I, I, I have so many friends that have wineries there or vineyards there. 
um, and people who just live there. Um, and, you know, I was hearing how they were evacuating and all of this stuff. My heart was going out to them. And uh, not that I think I could have done anything if I was in California, but being in New Jersey, I, I, I was... I was so worked up because there was nothing I could do. And all I could hear was how horrible things were. And I think that one of the things that I'm trying to do with all of the blog posts that I'm writing um, is somehow weave in wine country is open. Get your butts out there, drink the wine, go visit. Yes, I saw horrible destruction. And yes, I know people who have lost their homes and have lost everything. But they are strong and they are coming back. But uh, on the East Coast, it was like the end of the world on, on, in California. And that's what I'm trying to do out of this is, uh, you know, just try to get the blog posts out there, get the podcast out there that it's, it, it's horrible, but there's so much still great out there. So I don't know what your impressions are. Um. I'll go first only because I'm going to have to go because my computer is telling me it's almost dead. Um, <laughs> so this will be my last little thought um, is that I completely agree with you. Um, people, I think there's kind of two perspectives. Um, two people that are far away from um, this disaster either don't realize the magnitude of it um, and just think like, oh, like it was like a little bushfire or something like that. No, no, people's homes were, were destroyed. Um, so it's it's a big deal, um, but no, vineyards and wineries and you know yes some were affected but that's not the majority of of what's going on, um, and so there's still so much to see there's still so much to do, um, and the best way to I think help rebuild the city is to you know if you canceled your vacation think of it more of a postponement. Um, I've talked to so many small business owners who are like, hey, you know, October was supposed to be the month that we made up for all of our, you know, I just started my, my new tasting room in downtown St. Helena and, you know, it was slow go and we were supposed to pick up in October and no, they didn't, you know, so to help rebuild um, the, that that kind of, you know, to, I don't know, I, I, Amber's going to speak <laughs> even better than I can because she lives actually in wine country. Um, but I, I just, my takeaway is that, um, you know, there are so many people who were affected because maybe their homes weren't destroyed, but you know, their, their jobs were put on hold for so long. So even if you weren't left without a home, you know, you're left without an income. So there's, there's that. Um, and I, I was lucky enough. Well, I don't know about lucky enough, but, um, Lisa Matson from Jordan Winery took us through her neighborhood, which was completely destroyed. Um, luckily, her house is in such a state that they can um, more renovate than rebuild. Um, she's one of the lucky ones. Um, but I, I chose not to take photos. I chose not to write about the devastation, and I chose not to tweet out or Instagram photos of the horrible things that happened because I want people to come and feel comfortable when they come to one country. So I feel like not to take away from what people went through, but to highlight all the positive that's still going on. Exactly. Um, and so with that, I think I'm going to have to take my leave, but it was nice to um, speak with all of you guys. And I know that I will again on yeah. the uh, Twitters and the Instagrams, of course. Um, and for anybody who's listening, if you guys want to reach out to me, um, my name is Stacey. I'm on briscoebites.com. That's my blog. And um, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter. If you want to just Google my name, I'm sure you'll find me. Right. And these guys will probably help you find me too if you yes. get really lost. Yes, we will. Um, all right. Have a good night, guys. Thanks for joining, Stacy. Good night, Stacey. Good night, good night, good night Stacey. You know, similar to Stacy's approach to even during the, the fire presentation, um, you know, I took a picture of the slide with all the statistics on it, and I tweeted that out. But I took a different approach. I think they were trying to illustrate just the massive scale of the devastation. 
but what I took away from that was the, the, the very small number of wineries that were actually destroyed or damaged. And that was the gist of my tweet was, mm -hmm. hey, look, regardless of what the national media is trying to convey, that you know, the entire Northern California wine country is completely demolished, it's not. There were so few wineries. There's over 800 wineries in Napa and Sonoma County, and a handful were damaged. So get out here, do your tourism, buy your wine. Um, you know, I, I just try to put that positive spin on it. Right. Yeah. When we were driving for this, uh, as I mentioned, when we saw all of this, so before um, <coughs> the driver said that we, we, we're going to go through this sort of fire zone. So I was like, I was sitting there by the window and I was thinking, oh, OK, so I will uh, maybe I will record a video and I, mean, I don't know, we'll do something with it. As soon as I saw it, I was like, absolutely no way. There is no way I can record a video of this. This is just no not not going anywhere this is that's not what we need to uh talk about we need to talk about the people it's all there the wine are there the, the wine country is open and everybody should really don't change your plans don't cancel your plans just come buy wine drink wine that's that's the best thing you can do that's it that's i mean that's the only message to take and Amber, you really were in the midst of it, so. Yeah, I, I was and I wasn't. So my husband and I were in Italy uh, when the fires broke Which out. I can't imagine uh, what you were going through. It, it was so horrendous. So we, we were evacuated. Our house was evacuated. My poor mom, who was cat sitting, um, you know, she has heart problems and you know breathing in the smoke and everything was just horrendous and it, she's from southern california she has nobody here so from italy i'm trying to find people to take my mom in and a place for my cat to go um it, because you know you can't take a cat and put him in somebody else's house um, from Italy. And it was, it was so horrendous and worrying, okay, well, we're in Italy and my mom is elderly and she can't, you know, obviously clear out our house and our, our house is in the burn zone. So what can we do from here? Um, thankfully, thank God, that everything turned out fine. The the fire only got two miles from us, and that sounds like a long way, but the the winds were 70 miles an hour winds, and so two miles could have happened in you know a heartbeat. So we're so grateful and thankful that our house didn't go up. But we just we took an attitude of it's just stuff, and not worrying about our home or our cars or anything, you know, else. Um, we were more worried about people. Um, our community was devastated by the fires. The, um, it crawled right on over the hill, um, and down, you know, through the vineyards. Um, and you know, so many people died and it was so horrible. Um, it was, it was really hard. But the aftermath of the fires, the air quality and stuff like that, what was so funny was, I mean, it took, I don't know, I guess about five days after the fires ended for the air quality to be good enough to where my mom could actually come back to the house. Wow. It was that bad. But, you know, it's so funny because even weeks after the fire, my goddaughter in um, Wisconsin was telling somebody about, oh, my God, you know, I can't even imagine what my auntie is having to go through with the horrible air quality. And I'm like, OK, yeah, we had smoke, but this is this is a once in a lifetime fire that happens. I mean, it was just so incredible. And the smoke and there was so long and so many places there was no place for the smoke to go. Yeah. So I think out of it was a lot scarier to people. And then, you know, and of course, the wind situation, and everything else. But I think that was another thing that was just outrageous is because the smoke actually went all the way into San Francisco. We got it and, in Fresno. 
Yeah. We got it in Fresno. We, we had smoke, we had, we had smoke and I was like, I can't believe this is from there. And that's, that was it. That was where it was from. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think, I think that was the thing and and you know, people just don't understand about how vineyards work about the flash fires that go through, burn off all the leaves. But by next year, you watch, I mean, if you're even going now, I mean, I've been, I hope, I know you all have noticed that I took some, I've been taking a lot of photos of the vineyards and showing people, hey, it is gorgeous here. You know, and even with, even when you're seeing the fire places that have been it's kind of like this little gray patch uh, amongst you know the beauty you know and you're not even really seeing how the fires were when you're in downtown or in the main drags of uh, napa anyway you're looking up on the hills and you're seeing a little tiny bit of gray you have to seek out and go to the neighborhoods really that have the fire damage and and you know a lot of them are way far away from civilization unfortunately santa rosa did get in in their suburbs you know all those homes are demolished but um for the most part you don't see that i mean you just really don't we were at ledson that's our that is my number one photo that i've ever put on instagram which which got to number one actually oh wow congratulations Um, Thank you. Um, which, by the way, which, by the way, in New Jersey was burned down to the ground. Right, right. And, you know, um, you know, showing people these pictures of Ledson after the fire, and you can't even tell. I mean, and, and you know, you could see a little bit on the hill, but you really couldn't tell. So, you know, it's crazy. Even the staff were telling me that they had heard from the news that their business was burned down. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so it, it's interesting. It's, it's interesting. And, you know, thank God for the first responders and our firefighters yes. who really kicked butt and, and, uh, it was, it was, you know, thank, thank you God for what he did spare, you know, and we will rebuild and the places that, I mean, look at Signorello. I mean, what an inspiring, wonderful story. Yeah. Their wine was off property. Thank God their wine was off property except, you know, and, and what was in their tanks is fine. So, you know, they're going to rebuild. They're going to be bigger and better and more beautiful than ever. Mm-hmm. And in the meantime, they're making it work. So, you know, yeah. It, it, We'll, we'll be there, but what we need is people to come. We need people to come to Napa. We need people to come to Sonoma. And we need people to come here to, to my own AVA, which is Green Valley, you know, and, and because we were really affected by the fires and people, you know, are staying away. So mm-hmm. please, you know, come, drink wine, you know. There you go. Yeah. Well, drink wine, it. help people. It's a good motto. It's a good yep. motto. Right. Yeah. Anyway, I want to thank you guys for taking your evening to be with me to share your thoughts on the Wine Bloggers Conference. And it was great to see your faces again. And I miss you already. Thanks for listening to Dracina Wines Podcast. If you have suggestions of what topics you would like us to discuss, please reach out to us on social media or at justinawines at gmail.com. If you liked our podcast, please subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or whichever podcasting program you use. To easily subscribe at iTunes, please go to bit.ly forward slash Podcast. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Capital D for Dracina and capital P for podcast. We would greatly appreciate you leaving a review on your favorite system. It helps others to find us. Let's get social. Find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, Pinterest, YouTube, Google Plus, and Periscope at, at Dracina Wine. And I am on LinkedIn as Lori Hoyt Bud. Check out our award-winning wine at tracinawines.com. And remember to always pursue your passion. Slancha!